Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. Today I'm talking to Gustavo Glusman. Gustavo is a principal scientist at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. And uh, he's the first author of the recent paper, Ultrafast Comparison of Personal Genomes via Precomputed Genome Fingerprints. Gustavo, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, good morning. You work at the uh, Institute for Systems Biology. Uh, what did you do uh, before you, you took the job? Yeah, so I've joined the Institute for Systems Biology back in 2001. So it's been a long time here doing computational genomics. Uh, before that, I did my PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Rehoboth, Israel. And so what, what's, your, uh, what's your background? What did you study? So I'm a biologist in training, started from biochemistry. And uh, from my master's and PhD, I've uh, completely moved into the computational side of biology. So doing computational biology, definitely focusing on computational genomics. And um, so over the years, I, I started from doing analysis on gene families. Uh, for my PhD, I focused on the olfactory receptor gene superfamily, which are you know almost a thousand of them in the human genome. Um, and then from there, I moved to doing analysis of uh, some other gene families, and then the whole genome sequence, kind of the, the reference human genome, comparison to other genomes of uh, other species, and uh, and then eventually we started moving from there to analyzing individual genomes. So we started from sequencing a family of four individuals, so both parents uh, unaffected with any obvious disease and both children affected with a couple of diseases. So we sequenced the whole genomes of these four people and we identified the, the variants caused in the diseases. Uh, and then from there, the progression was, of course, to sequence other families with other diseases. And we started accumulating uh, hundreds and then thousands of genomes, uh, mostly in family context. So we developed lots of algorithms for uh, identifying variants uh, causing disease and, generally speaking, understanding how genomes uh, can be studied in family context uh, and uh, so that led to an accumulation of a very, very large data set of genomes and related data. And that pretty naturally pushed me into getting more involved in the big data analytics. So that's where I'm heading at the moment. And uh, this article about the genome fingerprints is uh, kind of one of our, our latest uh, attempts to deal with this uh, massive amount of genomic data and enjoy it in a variety of ways. So this transition from uh, biology and biochemistry to the computational sciences, did it happen out of necessity for you? Or did your interests actually shift towards computational sciences? So the reality is that I have been programming even before I started learning biology. So I've always been interested in developing algorithms and uh, coding has always been fun for me. Um, so... Once I started uh, learning biology and I started doing, you know, wet lab work, which is perfectly fine, but I, I thought I was more effective on the computer, just analyzing data related to biology, interpreting biological data as, as opposed to spending the day by petting. And how did you transition to the uh, Institute for Systems Biology? Right. So, so I came to the ISB to do my postdoc. And then uh, after couple of years working as a postdoctoral fellow, I was promoted here to research scientist and to senior research scientist, and more recently I, I became a principal scientist here. Tell us a bit more about the, the institute itself, because to be honest, this is uh, the, the first time I hear about it. It probably says more about me than about the institute, but what's the, what's the structure of the institute? What, what are its goals? So the Institute for Systems Biology was founded in the year 2000 by Lee Hood, Alan Adarim, and Rudy Eversold. Uh, they, all three of them, came out from the uh, University of Washington. And uh, Lee Hood wanted to create a, a new structure, a new organizational structure for developing this uh, concept of uh, systems biology, which was a brand new idea back then. And he wanted to combine people from uh, many different uh, areas of research, so not just biologists, but uh, also computational people and chemists. And uh, we even had several physicists and even astronomers. Uh, 
the joints of not experiencing uh, different types of computation and people developing technology. So to have a, a group, a pretty complex uh, group of uh, people with different uh, backgrounds to be able to work together to develop this, uh, essentially this new type of, uh, of biology that was called systems biology. But this is still a, a non-profit organization, right? Yeah, this is definitely a non-profit organization. So how is it different to work at, at the institute compared to, let's say, university? Is it just that you don't have to teach or do you notice any other differences? So we do not teach undergrads. Uh, so we have very few undergrad students that come to work with us. We have affiliation with uh, UW, University of Washington. And now and then we have uh, students from other institutions as well. So they and they study their courses elsewhere and they come here to do research. Uh, we mostly focus here on training uh, graduate students and largely uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, we have here a relatively small number of faculty groups, and uh, that's almost a formality because there is uh, essentially no boundaries, no real boundaries between the different groups. So the, the institute is essentially one very large group with uh, lots of people collaborating. It's no no problem whatsoever walking over to anybody from some other group and just establishing a, a new collaboration, starting working on some project. And your research on uh, genome fingerprints, is this at the center of your research program or was it a byproduct, something you just needed to carry out some other research and just decided to publish it? Right. So, so again, the situation was that we were accumulating hundreds and thousands of uh, genomes, personal genomes. And uh, as you can imagine, when you start getting so much data and we got it through many different collaborations, so you start amassing this very large database that can become quite unruly. And uh, you can get into situations where uh, you might even get the, the genome of the same person twice from more in more than one version, uh, or you might get uh, related individuals from different projects and you might not even know, know that they are related. So we needed a method for uh, being able to compare genomes easily and quickly to be able to establish what, what are two copies of the same person's genome or related individuals to be able to understand population structure of all the genomes that we're dealing with. Uh, so there was this need to be able to compare genomes easily. And not only that, but uh, there's all this uh, need to keep uh, privacy of the genome data. So uh, if uh, a collaborator said, uh, um, here's a set of genomes that I would like to analyze and uh, to have related people in your data set, or can I access genomes of uh, that could be appropriately used as controls for some study, uh, I could not simply give access to all the genes that we have in house. So this uh, method of uh, the genome fingerprints also enables the ability to compare genomes without revealing the entire content of the genome. So th there was this background need for the ability to compute on lots of genomes as complex objects uh, with all kinds of constraints of uh, again speed and complexity of the analysis and the need to do it uh, maintaining privacy. And there was one other very, very important thing is that uh, I mean, the vast majority of people use uh, Illumina as a basic te technology for sequencing. Uh, we have been collaborating from uh, very early on, from 2008, with uh, Complete Genomics, a different company that sequenced uh, genomes using completely different technology. So we had a whole variety of uh, versions of the technology of Complete Genomics. And then we also started accumulating genomes done using Illumina technology. Of course, if you want to compare genomes done with different technologies, that introduces a whole variety of additional difficulties. Uh, not only that, but uh, the reference genome changed over the years. So we had a very large number of genomes on one reference, uh, a small set of genomes from a previous reference, and then we started getting genomes on, on an even newer reference. And that also makes it very, very difficult to compare the genomes. And again, so then that's all kind of all kinds of different considerations that they had in mind when developing this method that uh, solves pretty much all of them in one shot. That makes sense. 
So I think it's a good time to introduce more formally what we mean by uh, genome fingerprinting. So I'll, I'll explain to you how I understand it, and then you can tell me how close I am. So I think about it this way. If we have a genome uh, stored in, in a file, then we could hash it using a program like SHA-1, SHA-256. That would reduce this multi-megabyte, multi-gigabyte file uh, down to a short hexadecimal string. And the property of that string is that with a very high probability for different inputs, it will give very different outputs. So you can use this hash to decide whether two files are identical without re revealing anything about the contents of the file. But the downside of the hash, well, depending on your point of view, uh, so in many cases, this is a desirable property, but in your case, it is a downside that even a smallest change in the file in the file's contents will lead to a drastic change in the hash. It will be a completely different hash. And so genome fingerprints are sort of like these hashes, except if you change the file just a little bit, the hash itself will also change just a little bit. Is, is that a fair description? Right. So the most important thing to understand about this is that when people say hashing, uh, there's multiple different styles of hashing. And kind of the most basic distinction is uh, what, what, I, what I think about it as cryptographic hashing on one hand and locality sensitive hashing on the other hand. So what you described is essentially cryptographic hashing where you can take some object and hash it into a relatively small fingerprint or a string. And, and again, indeed, as you said, it has that property that uh, if you change even one bit, it's supposed to have this uh, avalanche effect where the entire hash changes. And, uh, and indeed, somebody published several years ago a procedure for taking uh, genome data and computing cryptographic hashing of it with pretty much the same intent of saying, this is a reduced representation of a genome, and now I can compare it with the other genomes and say, is this the same person? Uh, but, but indeed, that has that property that uh, the very tiniest change leads to a different result. And we know from the beginning that there are going to be changes because these are genomes that are certain using technology. Technology has error. So every sequencing error or every, every area of the genome that is not perfectly covered, again, we're talking about a very, very large, complex object. So there's going to be plenty of differences between even two consecutive sequencings of exactly the same person's genome using exactly the same technology. So cryptographic hashing is... It sounds like a good idea, but uh, it doesn't help for this for this purpose. The other style of uh, of hashing is locality sensitive hashing, uh, which was developed uh, many years ago by uh, Pieter Indek and uh, Motwani. And uh, in that style of uh, hashing, it has exactly that property that uh, small changes to the original data lead to small changes in the hash. So it essentially preserves distance between objects. So if I, have, if I have two objects that are identical, they will lead to identical hashes. If the two objects are slightly different, the hashes should be slightly different. And the more difference between the two original objects, the more difference between the two hashes. And that's exactly the property that I needed for being able to compare genomes, not just for the purpose of saying, are these likely two copies of the same person maybe done with in, using different technologies. So they are going to be different, but not almost the same. Or even beyond that, being able to say, well, this, these two people are clearly related. They seem to be parent-child or maybe siblings or cousins or even unrelated, but within the same population. Or they might be in clearly different populations from different continents. Or if you take that to extreme, you might even say, well, these two genomes are so completely different that they might as well be different species. So you brought up um, this locality-sensitive hashing. And uh, what I found interesting about it is that your method actually doesn't quite fall into the framework of locality-sensitive hashing, at least the way it is defined in the Wikipedia article. The way it's defined is you have a locality-sensitive hash if... 
when you have close inputs, then with some probability you get exact same hashes. And uh, when you have uh, sort of far away inputs with certain probability, you get um, distinct hashes. But there is no no metric, no um, notion of closeness in the space of hashes. They're either identical or not, but the close inputs with high probability will map to identical hashes. And so I guess with, with that definition, your fingerprints aren't quite, sort of formally speaking, this locality sensitive hashes. But I'm curious uh, whether you considered using some of the methods developed for locality sensitive hashing, whether you had some success in applying those methods to, to genomes. I mean, you mentioned the definition given on Wikipedia. I haven't seen that definition for a while now, but uh, I mean, it's entirely possible it's just a wrong definition. I mean, if you go back to the original paper and if you look at the many papers that have been published since then uh, using var variants on locality sensitive hashing, there is definitely this uh, sense of a metric of, again, the, the more dissimilar things are. It's not a likelihood of getting the same or different, but it actually you actually get different levels of similarity between the hashes. I mean, of course, if, if uh, you're going to take two hashes as, again, binary strings or hexadecimal strings and just ask the question, are they identical or not? Then, yes, that's going to limit that kind of output to a very binary yes or no. But uh, in our case, what we are doing, and, and again, it's not unique to our method. I mean, other other applications do similar things. Is uh, So we compute uh, these fingerprints as a vector of numbers. And then having that vector of numbers, you can compute the correlation between them. And that gives you a, a metric of how similar they are. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, maybe maybe you should uh, correct the Wikipedia article. <laughs> uh, but so, so back to my question, D uh, did you try applying some of the existing locality sensitive hashing methods? And did you get any success with that? Right. So, so one common misconception, again, about uh, using locality sensitive hashing for genomes is uh, what exactly do we mean by the genome data? So if you take their human reference genome, I mean, that's clearly sequence in, for example, FASTA file. Uh, and you can use existing and very, very excellent tools like MASH to compute a locality sensitive hash fingerprint of the sequence itself of the human reference. And then you can take the reference of another species like a chimpanzee and you can compute a hash for that. And they're going to be, to some degree, similar. I mean, they're going to be very similar. And then you can take a, a more distant species, like you know, a cow, and compute a hash for that, and going to, it's going to be much less similar. So you can definitely take sequence and compute fingerprints from the sequence itself. Now, in our case, we are dealing with uh, not different species. We're talking about individuals from the same species, so different humans. And the standard format for representing uh, variants relative to a reference is, for example, the VCF file, the variant call format. So what we started from is not actual sequence, so not, for example, a BAM file, but the actual statements of a disposition in this chromosome with the reference being, for example, G, this person has an A as an alternate allele, and they are heterozygous. So a large collection of such statements which indeed you could, you could call that a genotype, but we are talking about uh, whole genome data. So all the variants observed or reported in the whole genome, that's why we refer to this as personal genome fingerprints or genome fingerprints for personal genomes. Uh, so we, we start from that data type, which is not the same as just bare sequence. So in that case, using a tool like MASH for fingerprinting the variance in a person's genome is simply not applicable. I mean, of course, you could go back and reconstruct the sequence for the person and use MASH to fingerprint that, but uh, it, it sounds like a shame to take a, a more refined product and go back to the, you know, the more primitive thing with a lot of uh, very heavyweight computation along the way just to use an existing tool when you can use, a, you can develop a much faster tool and simpler, more appropriate to the actual data type. Right. So, so what you're saying is that uh, 
among the published tools for genomics, uh, so there's this mesh, and and it doesn't quite work for for obvious reasons that it deals with sequences, and and you are talking about about genotypes really, well at, at least in in my uh, understanding. Maybe this is a good time to to settle uh, this um, this confusion. Uh, so it, it, indeed. Um, when I read the paper, I was confused because you were talking about genomes, and uh, to me they looked like genotypes because you you're talking about the specific sites of variation. You store them in a VCF file, um, but then uh, you just told me that you have another paper coming about not genome fingerprints but genotype fingerprints. So, what do you mean by genotype? Uh, versus the genome how do you draw that distinction right so in my mind uh, again the the main source of distinction is uh, if i take somebody's dna and we send it for sequencing or we obtained a vcf file representing here's all the variants that you observe genome wide uh, that's what in our minds is a personal genome on the other hand if you take that person's dna and you send it to a company like 23andme for doing genotyping uh, genotyping using uh, hybridization or microarray. So that DNA gets put on, on a chip and it only assays a limited set of positions in the genome, typically half a million, one million. Those are kind of the, the most common uh, versions of the chip that uh, 23andMe uses. And of course, there's other companies or you can do it in research context. And the result that you get from that is not a VCF. I mean, you could represent it as a VCF if you want, but the more common format is to say, for this variant, which is usually represented by the RSID identifier, uh, so for this variant, this is the genotype of the person. So, for example, if at some position in the genome uh, the reference allele is a G and I'm homozygous reference, then my genotype file that's going to that's going to give you the RSID and it's going to say that I am homozygous GG. That statement would typically not be mentioned in a VCF file, which is usually uh, used only to represent variants relative to the reference and not statements of homozygosity identical to the reference. So in my mind, those are kind of two very different data types. In one case, you're stating all the changes relative to a reference and using coordinates actual coordinates are going to change from reference version to reference version. In the other case, you're stating a whole series of, uh, for this variant identified with a stable identifier, the RSID, here's the actual genotype observed in the person. And that's presumably not going to change from reference to reference because we're already using RSIDs. And again, comparing these two different things, so comparing a VCF to a VCF or a genotype file to another genotype file are different problems. So for, for that reason, we created different versions of the method. Uh, one of them, uh, the, the one based on the VCF, it has to deal with difficulty of matching a variant observed in one genome relative to one reference to the same variant observed in maybe the same genome, maybe a different genome, but relative to a different reference. So it's going to have a different coordinate. So you need to have some mechanism for saying is this the same variant? On the other hand, for the genotype format, uh, the identity of the variant is already stated in the file itself. Right, right. That, that makes sense. So you were saying that it's not very useful to apply tools like MASH to these kind of problems when you compare individuals within the same species um, because you want to concentrate on the differences and they're mostly, so they, the full sequences are mostly identical, right? But once you uh, consider this data structure, the VCF file that represents the differences between your genome and, and the reference genome, um, have you, so your method, as I understand it, is sort of a completely new thing uh, it, it was designed specifically for this task. And I'm curious whether you consider using sort of traditional, you know, locality sensitive hashes that are generally like published in computer science literature. So, again, kind of disclaiming the fact that I'm a biologist and uh, 
likely not the most well-versed in locality-sensitive hashing literature, but uh, um, so to put it in, in kind of historical context, if you wish, uh, I came up with the concept of how to compute these fingerprints. And at that time, I had no idea about what locality-sensitive hashing is. So I was all excited that, hey, I just created a completely new kind of algorithm. And then uh, through discussions with uh, colleagues, I learned about locality sensor hashing, and I understood that this is uh, essentially an application of locality sensor hashing. And I started, of course, out of interest because I find this class of algorithms fascinating. So I started collecting uh, a very large uh, set of uh, papers describing applications of locality sensor hashing for different purposes. And uh, my impression, again, was that uh, it's it's a a class of algorithms. It includes a whole variety of different ideas in it. And uh, every single time I saw people trying to apply the method to a different domain, uh, there was the need to to do specific transformations of the data into something that then can be hashed appropriately. So I, I never encountered something like, a, here's a generic tool that you can apply any kind of uh, input to it, and it's going to compute a standardized locality-sensitive hash. And again, for the for the purpose of efficiency, I, uh, I simply consider that it's, it's very, very uh, logical and convenient to just have a, a very simple tool that uh, understands what the VCF is, and just in one, you know, one read through the VCF file, just computes the, the hash on the fly. It sounded to me a uh, a lot more relevant than uh, I don't know, finding some kind of standard tool where you can read the entire VCF, transform it into something, and then try to use it using a standard method. Fair enough, yeah. Let's talk about the applications of this method. So you already mentioned that it helps you to um, remove duplicates. Uh, it helps you to maybe find the uh, relatives in the data set or uncover the population structure, which is something uh, I also want to talk to you about. What are some other applications that you can think of of, of this method? Oh, it, it has many, many different applications at many different levels. So, I mean, essentially, pretty much anything that you can think. Uh, so here's a metric of similarity between two complex elements, right? So, for example, the genomes. So, again, the idea of... Uh, uh, I just sequenced a new genome. Did I already have it in my database? So finding duplicates. Uh, an extension of that is uh, you get two collections of genomes from different uh, institutions, and you need to merge them into one larger data set. Are there shared genomes among the two sets? And one logical application of that is uh, uh, you get access to genome data that was used in some important, uh, I don't know, some kind of analysis by one institution, and then you get access to the same kind of data from another institution, and you want to do a meta-analysis of those results. Uh, so it's very important to know whether the same people participate in both studies. Uh, so th that's kind of a whole series of applications of being able to simply say, is this the same person or not the same person? Uh, then... Beyond that, there is the identifying close relatives, uh, which means at the, kind of at the very, very simplest, uh, uh, these are two closely related individuals, like again, parent, child, or uh, siblings, or uncle, uh, or cousins, second cousins, and kind of a, a larger application of that is, uh, so first of all, similar to the previous one, if you need to do a meta-analysis and the two studies are using close relatives among unrelated individuals, then you definitely want to adjust for that. By comparing these fingerprints, uh, can you tell the sort of relationship, the, the degree of separation? Uh, are there some thresholds that you arrived at that you can say this is a parent or a, you know, a cousin? Yes, we, we included an analysis of a large family in the paper. In which, uh, so we of course, since this is a very large family with lots of uh, subfamilies or smaller groups, uh, nuclear families in it, uh, so we could identify a very large number of uh, pairwise relationships within the family. So lots of uh, 
uh, unrelated individuals, uh, lots of uh, parent-child relationships, siblings, cousins, etc. And for each of those groups or different uh, levels of uh, relatedness, we computed all the observed pairwise similarities among fingerprints. And we included there a figure in which we, we show that uh, there's one main parameter to the method, the size of the fingerprint. So once a fingerprint is sufficiently big, which is actually pretty small, uh, the level of similarity between pairs of uh, related individuals is pretty consistent. So mm -hmm. you can indeed recognize uh, how similar, how, how related two people are. I mean, of course, if I take two people and compute their fingerprints and correlate them and you get a number of 0.4 or 0.56, I mean, that doesn't have any absolute meaning. But compared to uh, a cohort, so all the, in the, all the pairwise uh, comparisons in a cohort, you can indeed derive predictions of, yes, these appear to be cousins or parent-child relationship. And I mean, the system, the, the method actually manages to distinguish between a parent-child relationship and siblings, which is something that uh, actually bothered uh, some people in the field because <laughs> they say, well, uh, it's exactly the same degree of relationship, so you should not be distinguishing. To me, that was a very puzzling statement because, I mean, if, you know, sure, I mean, I can make the statement that these are parent-child or these are siblings, and from that I can transform that into a, a statement about uh, their kinship. Uh, but, I mean, in my mind, the fact that I can distinguish the two is even a benefit. So it's kind of surprising that people say that you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Why not? Huh. Can you tell them apart because you know sort of the different alleles, so you don't just know in aggregate how they differ? So, so the, the basic idea is, uh, I mean, of course, with my parents and with my siblings, I share the same average, I mean, on, on average, I share the same fraction of the gene. But that average is important. I mean, of course, with my parents, I share a very precise subset of the genome, right? I mean, one haploid copy I received from my mother. On the other hand, with my sister, I shared, uh, on average, half of the genome is, again, one, one copy is identical. A uh, quarter of the genome, I am essentially identical, as if I were an identical twin with my sister. And then there is yet another quarter of a genome in which we are as related as our parents were. So the, the methodology for computing the fingerprints uh, is sensitive to this difference between the two scenarios. Yeah, so uh, with my parents, I share exactly one half, right? Whereas with the siblings, I share on average one half, but in practice, that differs from one half. But still, there's a non-zero and actually quite significant probability that it will be exactly one half, I guess. So in that case, would it still work? Okay, that, that's a pretty nuanced question, and I uh, would we'll definitely need to go into the details of the algorithm quite deeply to figure it out. But uh, again, the idea is that uh, the genome fingerprints method, uh, it pays attention to a collection of statements of where you are different from the reference, right? And as, as implemented in the first version that, uh, I mean, as we published it, uh, I am intentionally not distinguishing between are you different from the reference in one of your alleles or in both of your alleles? Okay, so being heterozygous or being homozygous for an alternate allele, in both cases, uh, that information is essentially equivalent for the purpose of computing the genome fingerprints. I have other versions that I already kind of preliminarily tested and didn't make it to the publication. Uh, I guess we're going to develop that in the future and publish separately. Uh, in which I I did make uh, a distinction between those two cases in various ways. So you could say, for example, if you're a homozygous alternate allele, give that twice the weight, or or even the other direction. Say, uh, create a fingerprint in which you only pay attention to heterozygosides. And that has some interesting properties, and there are some reasons why that would be actually a good idea to do. And, uh, and again, by, by changing this uh, relative weight between uh, heterozygous sites and homozygous alternate, you get different levels of distinction between those two cases, special cases of the parent child and the siblings. So some of these variations make the distinction even stronger and some of them make it, make it less. <laughs> 
we already discussed the difference between genomes and genotypes as, uh, as sort of understood in, in your works. If I wanted to apply this genome method to a genotype, so let's say I got my data from 23andMe and uh, mm -hmm. I represent it as VCF and I apply, would that be a sensible thing to do? You could do that, uh, but you probably would not want to try to compare such a mock genome fingerprint, if you wish, to an actual genome fingerprint, because uh, a lot of information available in the whole genome data would be missing. Right. But you could still compare them among themselves, right? You could compare them among themselves. They would likely be more similar to each other. Yeah. Because everybody has the same variants on the chip. Right. What you can definitely do is go the other way around. You can take whole genome data from a VCF and select only the variants that are present on a chip and create a, a genotype file based on the information you saw on the VCF. Yeah. And then you can compare them at that level. So it's, again, going back to the idea of uh, here's a sequence, for example, in a FASTA file or the BAM file, then you do some analysis and you derive from that a VCF relative to a reference, and then you can do an even further analysis and kind of selecting things and extracting the genotype and identifying the actual variants, and then you get to the genotype level. So these are three different levels. Each time you get more refined result, if you wish. That's why the, it makes sense to have different algorithms for each of the three levels. I mean, you can move from one to the other, but they're not equivalent. One of the desirable features of your method in, in many contexts is privacy. You can share the fingerprints and be more or less certain that the raw genotypes cannot be recovered. How sure can you be really? So, like, did you try to prove some sort of properties, some guarantees that this information is not recoverable? Or is it just common sense that, like, this looks quite complicated to recover and I don't know how to do that and probably it's not doable or at least not precisely doable? So can you guarantee, maybe with, with some probability, that I cannot take this fingerprint and recover, maybe not the whole genotype, but maybe specific alleles? That's a fantastic question. There's actually multiple answers to that. So different things that we tried and we, so both theoretical and actual analysis. So one thing to keep in mind is first of all, this, uh, this procedure of taking a whole genome VCF and going down to a pretty reduced matrix of numbers is massively lossy. So we're losing intentionally lots of information and uh, it, I mean, if, if you think about the uh, the classical desire in a, in a proper hash to avoid collisions, in this case, we're intentionally building as many collisions as possible into the system. So there's going to be many, many instances of statements coming from different places in the genome that are going to contribute exactly in the same way to the same uh, cell in that matrix that is the genome fingerprint. Uh, so again, there's... Uh, significant loss of information that uh, it's essentially blurring all the identity intentionally passing here so you can choose to, to delete it later if you choose or not uh, so for example i mean one, one interesting comparison that one can throw in is uh, recently there was a, a fascinating uh, uh, episode of uh, john oliver's uh, um, on cryptocurrencies and he uh, discusses the concept of uh, blockchain and uh, cryptographic hashing in that context and he interviews someone I, I forget at the moment who the person is that uh, tries to explain the idea of uh, trying to break a cryptographic hash uh, and he says it's as if uh, you you try to take a, a chicken McNugget, McNugget and try to reconstruct the chicken from it it's a good analogy but it's only an analogy so th there is sort of survival bias in that the hashes that we know today, like SHA-1, SHA-256, these are the ones that survived very thorough testing by the cryptographic community. And there have been a lot of hash functions that didn't survive that, that to, to an outsider, right, they would look exactly as puzzling as SHA-1 and the same analogy of reconstructing chicken from a nugget would still apply, 
but they just didn't happen to be cryptographically secure. You can't just say that, you know, if, if this looks very complicated, then it's impossible to, to reconstruct. No, that, that, I, I agree. That's, uh, I mean, that's not definitely not the proof. Uh, we did try that. So I did try a whole variety of experiments in which I, I took genomes, I computed the, the fingerprints from them. I did experiments in uh, modifying uh, just one variant, a small set of variants that uh, are known, for example, from uh, GWAS to contribute to a risk for a specific disease. So modifying those uh, very, very small set of variants uh, to maximize the risk of the person for that disease or to minimize it, trying to predict based on the fingerprints what will be the risk of the person. Okay, so I tried all kinds of experiments like those, and at the end of the day, the result is that the changes that you can observe in a fingerprint by doing those minor changes, do they, do, does the person have this variant added or not, they are negligible compared to the amount of noise that you get from just genome sequencing itself. So that that's one consideration. I mean, of course, there, um, I mean, there is more. I mean, there is deeper considerations of differential privacy that need to be addressed, and we are doing that that kind of work. But the the basic idea is we we definitely tried doing all kinds of. Uh, how can we break this? And uh, uh, can we try to reconstruct, uh, for example, uh, when I rec recognize these two individuals are seem to be related to each other which section of the genome contributed to that similarity. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's essentially a way of trying to go back to the genome and say, here's the segment, the most important segment that contributed to that similarity. And I just couldn't do that. I mean, I tried them many different ways and it just didn't work. And, and I'm going to admit from the beginning that, of course, I, I, I couldn't do it so far it doesn't mean it's impossible to do. But there's plenty of reasons so far to see that uh, it's, it's a very, very hard thing to do. Again, there is the a priori concept that uh, so much information is lost. So you mentioned before that this also could be used to reconstruct the uh, population structure. So could, could you talk a bit more about that? Could you define, first of all, what population structure is and, and how would you use um, genome fingerprinting for that? Right. So, so that's also one aspect that we include in the, in the paper in which uh, I mean, there is plenty of existing literature and very, very well-established methods for taking a large cohort, like, for example, a thousand genomes, uh, which is called a thousand genomes, that includes 2,500 genomes. And uh, so you take all the VCF uh, representations of all those genomes, this massive amount of information, and based on significant prior knowledge of the human genome structure, you select a subset of the SNPs in those genomes, and you need to choose those SNPs, uh, again, to be uh, informative and as close as possible to uh, have half uh, frequency in the population, et cetera, et cetera. And after you did that and you reformat and you do all kinds of additional steps, eventually you manage to reconstruct from that uh, the classical view of uh, population structure you can see in uh, the Thousand Genomes paper and many other papers. Uh, so classically using PCA, and you get this V-shaped uh, structure with uh, African origin on individuals on one end and uh, Asian on another end and uh, Europeans close to the, the corner of the V. Uh, so again, that requires significant amount of prior knowledge, lots of computation, bringing all the genomes to the same representation, the same reference, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, using the genome fingerprints, on the other hand, it's kind of the beauty of the method that they can take, quote-unquote, raw genomes. Each of them could be on a different reference, sequenced by a different uh, technology, represented in different ways. And for each of them, I compute once the genome fingerprint, then collect all these fingerprints into a single matrix, including all the data, all the fingerprints, put that into PCA, and within a few seconds or a, a minute, you have exactly the same visualization of the population structure. So it's a, technically speaking, it's a system, it's an, an algorithm and a method that's super easier, much faster, much more convenient, doesn't require any prior knowledge. And uh, I can assure that if I, if I know a little bit about human genome structure and population structure, uh, 
uh, I definitely didn't know anything about, for example, the population structure of sheep or the structure of the genomes of sheep or of rice. Uh, so I simply downloaded large data sets of individual genomes of sheep and of rice, did exactly the same procedure and could reconstruct the population structure of both species, again, in a straightforward way without any difficulty. Uh, and, and it's not only just visually the representation that you get is consistent with what you get using the quote-unquote proper complex uh, procedures with a lot of prior knowledge, uh, but also the, the actual principal components that we get are the same. Yeah. So you're essentially getting exactly the same result. Yeah, they're, they're uh, strikingly similar, these graphs uh, in your paper. Uh, you say in one case you use fingerprints. In the original case, they use sort of carefully selected SNPs. Which raises the question, well, if, if these two are similar, maybe you could get to the same result without fingerprints, but just using the whole VCF. As it, I guess it would be maybe more computationally intensive, but the result... So surely th this just, just shows that you don't have to carefully select the SNPs? I mean, w one of the main drivers for selecting the SNPs is also the fact that... Uh, you need to reduce this, the amount of data that you're comparing. I mean, even if you select an appropriately informative set of uh, a million SNPs or half a million SNPs, your computer might not be able to handle that much information. So you, you try that and it takes way too long and the computer runs out of uh, memory and then you have to reduce the data set even further. Of course, that's a problem that's going to go away eventually with uh, stronger computers, but then people are going to want to analyze more genomes. <laughs> So it's probably going to continue being a significant issue. On the other hand, this uh, genome fingerprints are compared to all those large data sets. They're, they're tiny. And, and, and again, one can reduce the size of a fingerprint using kind of a, a simple parameter of fingerprint size. And uh, so you can actually fine tune how much information you want to keep. So I guess by now I'm sold on your on your premise and your method. Now, tell me how it works. So again, as I mentioned before, uh, I came up with the idea without knowing what locality sensitive hashing is. And then I, I did quite a bit of research into how other methods of locality sensitive hashing work. And uh, the, the way I conceptualize this after looking at many papers is that uh, uh, if you start from a complex data set or a, a complex data type, uh, there is essentially two and potentially three steps that you need to do to create a, a useful locality sensitive hashing method. So first of all is identify elements in the data. So in this case, I could say, for example, I take a VCF and the elements I identify and choose are statements of single nucleotide variation relative to a reference. And, and that's a non-trivial choice. So for example, in a VCF, you could encode all kinds of additional statements about uh, multinucleotide changes or deletions, insertions, translocations, as many other things. So for the sake of simplicity and being able to compare between different uh, representations and data sources, I chose a very simple single nucleotide change. So that's kind of step one, choose an appropriate element. There, there could still be two alternative alleles, right? If let's say we have A in the reference and then the person is heterozygous with uh, C and G. That's correct. That's correct. So, so again, if you wish arbitrarily, we also define that as something that we do not include. Yes. Yeah. So, so we are going for, indeed, biallelic SNPs. Right. And, and again, biallelic means that just within this person, right? So this could be a SNP that in population, there are three alleles. But when considered only so both chromosomes of this person and the reference chromosome, then out of these three possible uh, nucleotides, you have just two, right? E exactly two, in fact. So, so you, you don't accept one and you don't accept three or four. That's correct. And, and that leads to, a, again, a potential issue there that if I compute a genome fingerprint for one person, that they have a VCF for just their genome, and I don't know, because I'm not looking at external information when computing the fingerprints. If I don't know that the site is triallelic, then I will likely include it. Yeah. If, on the other hand, I compute the, a genome fingerprint for this person in the context of a larger cohort, uh, 
and I see that the site is trialytic, I will exclude it. So the, the same person will have potentially somewhat different fingerprints. Oh, so you, you do take into account the, the cohort. It's not just based on the one individual. Again, very pragmatically, if the data comes in as a single person's VCF, mm -hmm. that's information I have. Right. I don't know about the cohort. But if the VCF if I'm giving file a multi contains, sample VCF, yeah. yes, if I take a thousand genomes, multi sample VCF, then I know the information about the cohort and I will exclude uh, trialytic or, or tetralytic variants. Mm -hmm. So that indeed will lead to slightly different fingerprints potentially for the same person. And again, we show in the paper that uh, the method is nevertheless robust to that kind of situation. So the, the comparison between two different versions of the same person's genome uh, is going to be nevertheless comparable. And it's going to be clear it's the same person. Yeah. Is, is it because um, there are relatively few uh, multi -allelic? Relatively rare, yes. Yeah. Because otherwise it would change significantly, right? If when you consider the genome in a cohort, it will be much more um, three allelic um, SNPs, then the fingerprint would be drastically different. That's correct. We, we also did a, a simulation experiment in which we progressively removed information from a genome. And we figured out that, uh, so we, we demonstrate that the method is robust to about 30% data loss. So again, any any kind of distortion that you add to a genome uh, up to 30% or so, it should the method should be robust to that. 30% mm -hmm. is a very sizable fraction. Cool. So you identify these features, this bi-allelic... Right. So, so the first step is, again, identify features in the complex object that you want to, to compute the hash on. And then depending on what kind of features we're talking about. So for example, for the case of the genotype fingerprints, uh, that information is already sufficient for computing the, the hashing function and incorporating all that into the fingerprint and we're pretty much done. So, so that's because the uh, sites are sort of standardized and universally known and you can compare them between the individuals. So the, the, the items or the, the elements that you identify, they, they are uniquely identified so you can very easily create a hashing function that compares the same thing. On the other hand, when we look at the VCF format for a genome, whole genome data, uh, that's where we run into the problem of, for example, different references. So if I look at one variant in HE19, uh, version of the genome, and the, then the same variant in uh, HE38 is going to be in a different location, likely in the same chromosome, but nevertheless probably shifted by a certain distance. Uh, so the insight that uh, pretty much started this entire project is the idea that uh, if I focus not on a single variant, but on pairs of consecutive variants, then the distance between two consecutive variants is going to be likely unchanged when I change reference. So even if the two variants are shifted, they're very likely going to be shifted by the same number. Mm -hmm. so, so again, instead of having the, the two-step approach of identify elements, hash them, now we have step one, identify elements, step two, do a transformation of the data, and step three, hash the transformed data. So in our case, the transformation here is to say, even though the elements were single nucleotide variants, biolytic single nucleotide variants, uh, the transformed element is a pair of consecutive biolytic single nucleotide variants. So, so now I can take the distance between the two as one element to uh, essentially label them. And the, uh, the other element that I took is the actual identities of the genome, of the the reference genome allele and the alternate allele for each of the two. So those two things, then I transform in a certain way into the hash, that's my hashing function. So another assumption that you make here is that the reference genome also doesn't change too much, right? So the, there is some kind of consistency because, well, let's say we have a... Uh, you know, reference European genome and reference African genome, if, if we had one, 
right? They, they would probably have very different reference alleles among them. And so I guess in that case, the fingerprints wouldn't be comparable. The fingerprints would again be somewhat less comparable. But uh, at the end of the day, even though, I mean, if we created reference genomes that are different for kind of whatever that means, people coming from different populations or different continents, at the end of the day, they're going to be very similar. I mean, most humans have almost the same genome at the end of the day. Sure, but but you're focusing exactly on the, on the differences. And where there are differences, sure, it's it's a very small percentage, like, Point uh, one percent or something, right? Of the uh, of the full uh, genome, but where mm-hmm. when when you focus on them, they will be very different between populations. There are going to be some regions of the genome in which you're going to find uh, that the the leading haplotype uh, is somewhat different, and still, even very different haplotypes are going to share a history, share a common history. So many of the variants in those distinct haplotypes are going to be positioned at the same distance relative to each other. Again, it's going to be, it's going to reduce the similarity between those uh, representations, but it's not going to destroy it completely. Okay. It's it's a good question. I mean, it's something that we need to evaluate if I were to create uh, very, very different references and uh, express the same person relative to references are not just shifted around but uh, with very very different variants in them uh yeah the expectations that they're going to be less similar than they are at the moment but uh, our our experience is again that uh, there's such a huge difference between the level of similarity you see for the same person or unrelated people or closely related people that uh, the method is likely going to be robust I mean, I, I would say that even talking about different references, uh, the, the method is, I mean, my, my expectation is the method is co- also going to work when we shift to, to graph reference genomes. What's a graph reference? Graph reference is uh, it's a new model that's being built at the moment uh, in which instead of having uh, the reference genome be a collection of linear sequences, one per chromosome, uh, there is going to be a, a graph, an actual graph in the mathematical sense, uh, in which you have uh, regions of a genome that are largely constant, being represented as kind of a, a node in the graph, and then it's going to be a bifurcation whenever there is variation. So a graph that you can actually traverse to reconstruct a person's genome. Once we have that representation, we start representing individual genomes relative to that, uh, since uh, the fingerprinting method is based on local structure. So again, identifying here's one variant, here's the next variant, how do, do they relate to each other? And that information is still going to be present and easily retrieved from a graph. So in, in that sense, I am very pleased that the method seems to be not likely to fail as soon as we change to the, the next significant version of the a, of a reference chain. After this transformation, your data is a set of pairs of SNPs, and for each pair, you know the uh, two reference alleles, the two alternate alleles, and you know the distance between those two two variants. So what, what do you do next? How next do you transform this data? So the, the method that we chose for... Uh... So again, the point is that once you have those characteristics of those elements, you need to define a hashing function uh, to bring all that information into the fingerprint uh, vector table matrix, whichever format you choose. And the most important characteristic of a hashing function is that uh, it should distribute information as uniformly as possible in, in the hash. So... For that uh, reason, I mean, the, the very first version of the algorithm that I tried was very simply to say, take the distance between two consecutive variants. That's it. And of course, that gives you uh, a very long tail distribution because some pairs of variants are very distant apart and there's not that many of those. So that was not a very comfortable hash to work with. Uh, so I came up with the idea, which is, again, uh, 
it felt very novel at the moment, but uh, I've seen it used in many, many other applications of using the modular function. So once you have the distance with the consecutive variance, so you apply modulo some number, and that number is the main parameter of the method, then that modular function is going to wrap those distances around into a fixed size table. So th that's one very consistent and easy way of uh, reducing all that complexity of that uh, long-tailed distribution of distances into a relatively uniformly distributed uh, uh, vector. It's not perfectly uniform, but it's close to uniform. And then we later on have a normalization step that uh, really brings it into uniformity. So, so that's, uh, that was kind of the, the second version of the, the method. Uh, but it was too lossy. So having a single uh, question that I was asking of a pair of variants, what's the distance between them, it was essentially losing way too much information. So then I came up with this idea of saying, well, since I have the, referen the identity for reference allele and the alternate allele, I just can combine those four letters. And it, that gives you a total of 144 combinations, right? Because you have four reference alleles for one position and three alternate alleles for the same position. That's 12 combinations. And now we're talking about combining two completely independent uh, consecutive variants. So you have 144 combinations. So I simply said, well, I'm going to take a matrix of 144 rows and a fixed length distance because I use a modular function. And that's going to be my, what I call the, the raw fingerprint. So simply counting how many times I observe variant pairs, consecutive variant pairs into that table, that's my raw fingerprint. Of course, this uh, fingerprint has a lot of internal structure. The reason for that is mostly because uh, when I say, here's a reference allele, here's the alternate allele, um, a mutation from one to the other, so the origin mutation from one of those alleles to the other um, was either a transition mutation or transversion mutation. And these two different types of mutations have very different frequencies in, in, the, in the genome. So transitions are a lot more common than transversions. Uh, so in that case, when I have the, the two SNFs, both of them being transitions, I expect that combination to be a lot more frequent than if one of them is a transition, the other one is a transversion, and that a lot more frequent than in both are transversions. So if you look at the uh, in depiction of that raw matrix, it has a lot of internal structure. And we have a very simple normalization step that uh, gets rid of that uh, internal structure and produces a, a final fingerprint, which is pretty uniform in distribution in both directions. Why is that exactly is it an issue that is not uniformly distributed? Right, so if, if you take this to an extreme just to make uh, it easier to visualize, uh, so suppose, for example, that uh, uh, your hashing function were so poorly designed that uh, the vast majority of the variants or the elements that you're trying to hash go into, let's say, for example, 10% of the cells in, in the vector of the matrix that you're using. And then the remaining 90% are essentially unoccupied. So that means that, uh, first of all, the fingerprint is uh, very inefficient because 90% of it is almost not being used. And, uh, and then it means that uh, when I correlate two fingerprints with that structure, they're going to be, by design, very similar to each other because those 10 are going to have significant values and the other, those 10% of, the, of the, the cells in the fingerprint are going to have significant values and the other 90% are going to be almost zero. So in, in that's, that's why it's more efficient uh, to have a, as uniform as possible distribution of uh, information in the fingerprint, in the hash. Uh, so for efficiency and also for having a, a wider distribution of correlations. I guess I'm still not convinced. In, in your example, when uh, a big number of cells are, are zero, right? Um, so your normalization, as I understand it, you just subtract the mean from the uh, rows and columns and then normalize by the variance or by standard deviation. Um, yep. That doesn't add any information 
to the matrix. If you have zeros in that matrix, they would just be transformed to the uh, mean. Some negative of, number, yes. Yeah. So you're just adding the mean, but that's not very informative. I, I still don't see what difference it makes. So the, the main point of normalization is actually to... to uh, Okay, if I go back to the idea of the raw fingerprint as a count of how many variants yeah. fell into each position in the matrix, uh, if you now think about two genomes that have uh, different numbers of variants, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe for genomes it's not the most intuitive uh, concept, but if you have two entities that you're trying to compute a, a hash for them using locality sensitive hashing, and one of them has twice as many elements as the other, so, for example, the, the genotype fingerprints, that's, that's actually a good example. So uh, I take your, your genome, your DNA, and you put it on two different versions of uh, microarray chips. Uh, and in one case, you get half a million statements about genotypes. In the other case, you, got, you get about uh, one million statements. Yeah. So the, the number of counts in those two matrices, or two raw matrices, are going to be different. One of them is going to have twice as many statements as the other. So the normalization steps brings them to a similar footing. Well, the way to, to bring them to similar footing would be just to rarify, take the intersection of the SNPs that were genotyped. But that's not, that's not what you're doing. You're replacing all the zeros in the smaller genotype with some uh, sort of derived values, but it's it's not clear. Like, superficially, they were zeros, now they are not zeros, <laughs> right? Um, but they're still... Let, 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 me just comment, let, let me just comment on what you said about uh, the way to compare those two different sizes will be to rarify. So, yeah, you could do that, but uh, on one hand, you would be losing a lot of information. And the other important thing is that to rarify, you need to know in advance what you're going to be comparing to. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah. one of the advantages of the, doing the fingerprinting is that you compute the fingerprints once in advance, and then you can compare them later on to anything. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. So, of course, you can rarify if you're comparing like pairwise, but if you want to hash it once and compare it with everything, that wouldn't do, of course. Still... What are you trying to achieve? To, are you trying to reduce correlation, to increase correlation by this normalization, right? So if you have some of them absent or some of them rare, some of them uh, frequent. So the, the, the more structure, yeah, the, the more structure there is in the hash, the more a priori structure, that's going to cause any fingerprints that you compute using that function to be more similar than you, than you expected. So taking again, take into an extreme. If uh, it doesn't matter what what the original data are, all the values are going to go to one position in the matrix. Then that's kind of trivially going to give you a perfect correlation for anything that goes into the, I mean, anything that you fingerprint, right? Yeah. So 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 again, there is this intuition that uh, the more uniformly you spread things, then the the less background noise of uh, trivial correlation you would have as a result. But let's take that example. Let, let's say that everything goes into a single cell in the table, right? Then you normalize it. Now your tables are still perfectly correlated. They're sure they're, they were zero. Now they're non-zero. They're sort of one over N or something, but they're still perfectly correlated, aren't they? Because you didn't add any extra information. I, I agree. That, that that's okay. That's not an example for explaining why why the normalization is valuable. Um, so again, if I go back to the the actual genome fingerprints, where I say that uh, some of the rows in the matrix are going to be a lot more populated because they have uh, pairs of transitions in them, and some rows are going to be very sparsely uh, populated because they have pairs of transversions. So if I don't correct for that in the fingerprint, then pretty much it doesn't matter which genomes you're using, a very significant amount of correlation is going to come from the fact that they have the same structure. So you have rows that have high numbers and some other rows that have low numbers. Uh, 
And the moment I collect for that, all, all those rows normalized internally to the same total sum, then the, the actual ratio between different cells in those rows becomes more informative. Okay. Now, another step that you take is you also filter out the pairs of variants that are too close to each other. Can you talk about the goal of that transformation or, or filtering? Yeah, so so that goes back to this uh, initial motivating uh, problem that we had. We had many genomes from complete genomics technology and many genomes from Illumina technology. So I created this method for computing the fingerprints and kind of not surprisingly I found that uh, when I started with the pairwise comparisons, complete genomics genomes were more similar to each other than they were to Illumina genomes. And we also com- we also tested this using uh, a set of individuals that were sequenced on both technologies. And still, the fact that the technology was different was distorting the data in the fingerprints enough to make it difficult to recognize it was the same person, just sequenced using different technologies. So I, I essentially had to do kind of a, a very specific analysis there to see where the difference was coming from. And what I ended up finding was that uh, um, when variants are really close to each other, especially with, within five up to 10 nucleotides from each other, then the two pipelines that the two different companies are using would represent them in a different way. So one kind of a very simple example is you have uh, two nucleotides, one after the other. So consecutive nucleotides that are both variant then uh, complete genomics would represent that as a multinucleotide change. And then on the other hand, the standard Illumina pipeline would represent those two as, as two independent single nucleotide variants. So in other words, what I found was that there was a very strong enrichment in difference between the two technologies exactly at that very beginning of the matrix, the very, very short distance between consecutive variants. So a simple solution to that was essentially to just censor that initial part of the matrix because I knew that that was so strongly enriched in differences within the two technologies. So so the, the procedure again became identify pairs of uh, consecutive dialytic SNFs. If they are short, I mean, if the distance is under a certain cutoff, then just ignore them or put them in that separate uh, matrix. If they are beyond that cutoff, then apply a modular function and add them to the raw fingerprint. And incidentally, this um, censoring of a small section of uh, the matrix, that also introduces internal structure into the raw fingerprint that needs to be corrected. So then that's another reason why we're doing the normalization step. But that difference, so if in one case you you call two different single nucleotide variations and in the other case you you call like maybe insertion or something. Um, that doesn't only affect that pair, right? It also affects the pair between uh, that two close variants and the next variant. So in, in this case, the pipeline also affects like even if you filter filter out the short distances and still in one case you will consider that snv with the next one which is possibly like far away right but in the other case you won't consider because you won't recognize this first thing as an snv in the first place so on one hand whenever there is a minor difference that indeed affects nearby variants um so one one aspect of this is that those differences are again rare enough that they introduce very little error. Uh, specifically about this uh, aspect of ignoring two close variants. So if you imagine, for example, a situation where you have one variant A, and then far enough from it you have a doublet of variants B and C, and then again far away from there is a fourth variant D. So. If I say variants uh, B and C are too close to each other, I cannot take them, so I'm going to ignore them. Then you still recognize the distance between A and D. Or if I if I say 
um, here's variant A. I recognize variant B. It is far away enough, so I take that pair. Now here's variant C. It's either at the distance of... Uh, it, it's at a very short distance, so it doesn't matter how you represented it. I just drop it. Yeah, exactly. So... Okay, I, I completely agree with you. I just complicated myself. <laughs> the, the bottom line is this kind of differences are rare enough that uh, that's not going to affect the fingerprint in a very significant way. Yeah, but I, I agree that that representation is going to cost a difference. But that, that, that's what I don't understand. Sure, surely these differences are twice as frequent as the ones that you filter out. So you filter out the short distances, right? And and for each pair of S and Vs that are close to each other, right, that's one distance, but for every such pair, you have two more distances to their sort of left neighbor and right neighbor where the neighbors are far away from them. If you're saying that it's worth filtering out the, the close ones, then... Uh, the far away happen twice as frequently. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean, and yeah, yeah, yeah and that I agree. You could probably improve on the method a little bit by suppressing both. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so as a result, you get this matrix with uh, 144 rows and a configurable number of columns, and the matrix, um, the raw matrix, contains just integers because those are counts of cases that fell into each cell but once you normalize them this is a matrix of um, fractional numbers and so how do you represent that matrix how do you serialize it etc right so the serialization method that we chose is simply to take those 144 rows and put them one after the other so that becomes a long vector of 144 times the width of the matrix that we chose. And then you can either take multiple fingerprints in that shape, so just one long vector, and put them all into a single matrix that you can apply to PCA or Disney or any other normalization method, not normalization, uh, ordination method. Or if you want to do a comparison between them, if you want to correlate them, then you can either just directly compute a Spearman correlation or a, a Pearson correlation between those two vectors. And that's your metric of similarity. Yeah, but um, you can't really print it like the, the way I printed SHA1 hash. Yes, and, and there is no intent of printing them in such mm -hmm. a way, yes. I mean, these are essentially a, a data structure that can be well managed by a computer and it's not meant to be displayed. I mean, of course, you can visualize it using a, a kind of colors on a matrix, as I put in the paper, but uh, they're not meant for human consumption in that sense. And and then when you store them, you use the full 32-bit or 64-bit or floating point numbers for, for each cell? Right, so so we have both we have both uh, kind of a, a text-based tabular version that is convenient for use in scripting uh, environments, and we also created a binarized version, so a, a proper binary serialized format that uh, we can then compute on uh, much faster. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, when you internally store, if you if you need to store a lot of these hashes. Uh, it becomes important how exactly you store them. And I was thinking that with uh, with integers, so before normalization, it would be more efficient because you could use short integers. So I'm, I'm not sure what the range of numbers are, but presumably they would fit in, let's say, into 16-bit integers. Yeah, that, that's, that's already getting into a very technical consideration that, again, that's the beauty of this fingerprints being small enough that... Uh, I really didn't need to deal with that too much. And, and again, we uh, we created this tool where you can uh, create a, the binary format that then can be computed on much faster. So th that figure that we, we quote in the paper of being able to do all against all comparisons of a thousand genomes in one minute on one CPU, I mean, that's definitely using the, the binary format and, uh, and, and not in a scripting language. Do you want to talk about the... Um genotype fingerprinting as opposed to uh, genome fingerprinting what, what are the main differences and uh, so you have this new preprint about 
genotype fingerprints, which I I haven't had a chance to 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 read. But are there any highlights that you want to bring up? So conceptually speaking, it's again very similar to the genome fingerprints. Uh, as as we discussed before, one starts from a more limited number of statements, but they are each of them there's or each variant is already identified using uh, an RS ID. So in that sense, it's a, it's a more elaborate initial data. So one point of interest about this is uh, when I take a VCF-based genome and I try to comp- I want to compute the fingerprint, my transformation was to take the distance between consecutive variants. Now for the data coming from a genotype uh, as produced by 23andMe, for example, there is no need to do that because each variant is already well identified. So what I'm doing instead there is I'm taking the actual number in the RSID, which is a number that doesn't have any intrinsic meaning. It's a very, very arbitrary number of, you know, in which order they were created by, by in the DBSNP database. And I am using that number, again, modulo some parameter as my hashing function to, to put all this information into the, the final fingerprint. And... Again, I got uh, a pushback from a reviewer saying that's a bizarre concept. I mean, these RSIDs don't have any meaning. This is not principled. Uh, you could go back to the actual genome coordinate and use that information. And again, I found this extremely puzzling because, uh, sure, I agree, these RSIDs don't have any meaning. So what? I mean, they are a, a perfect substrate for creating a hash function with the the beautiful property of distributing the information almost uniformly, close to uniformly, through the, the fingerprint. Well, the, the question is, do you know how they are allocated? Because if they're not allocated sequentially, then there could be some biases. And I agree that they are perfect inputs for hashing procedure, but it's just this simple hashing procedure of taking a model. Uh, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it can be non-uniform if these numbers are not allocated sequentially whereas if you put it into some you know proper hashing function then it would be very different i completely agree that's potentially a problem i did evaluate the distribution comes out it is almost essentially uniform so i didn't see a problem there and and again, and again there is this concept that uh, we have this three levels of information the the raw sequence the list of variants and the properly identified variants. So, so again, this reviewer was suggesting that I move down to a state of less knowledge, which again would require a lot of additional computation. So, so far you have developed the methods for genome fingerprinting, genotype fingerprinting, right? What's, what's in the queue for you? What were you working on in, in this area? Yeah, so the next step, uh, which is actually something that I'm about to publish a preprint very, very soon, is uh, we generalized the concept. Uh, We have created now a new method, and I'd be glad to talk about it uh, at length at some other opportunity, uh, in which we can take uh, essentially semi-structured data. So give me a JSON object, XML, so any arbitrary semi-structured data, and we can, again, fingerprint that. And so create a fingerprint from pretty much arbitrary structured data. And uh, one of the main uses that we have in mind, of course, is to be able to take uh, a person's electronic health record and compute from that a fingerprint. So to be able to say which patients are similar to this patient based on the entirety of the electronic health record without having to do any kind of complicated uh, normalization of the content, uh, in, again, in a way that's going to be very resilient to the structure of the actual health record. Even if there are typos in the record, it's going to be resilient to that. So I'm very, very excited by this new algorithm that we're working on. It has many, many possible uses. Cool, cool. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to talk about before we part? Yeah, so that's one thing that... Uh, It's kind of a a fun question here. I mean, I've always been curious about uh, where do ideas come from? (laughs) And uh, (laughs) so in this case, uh, 
I mean, I actually was able to reconstruct exactly how I got this idea for the genome fingerprints, and it's kind of fun. So on April 19th, 2017, I came up with this idea, and it felt totally out of the blue, right? So I'm, I'm just having a conversation with somebody, and, and suddenly it just pops in my mind. I, and then that, I mean, the day after that, I, I created the first uh, test version of it, and it, it just worked. And then, of course, I started uh, improving on it, adding the, the modular concept and all these different things. So April 19th, I came up with the idea, and it felt as if it came from somewhere who knows where. So I went back to my personal log and started digging. So where did it come from? And I found an entry from a couple of weeks before that, April 4th. We had uh, Atul Butte uh, came to give here uh, a talk at the ISB's uh, symposium. And in my notes from that presentation by Atul, I I found there, uh, I, I had written down, uh, here's an issue. There's big data that can be freely available in some cases, but uh, as Atul said, there is uh, difficulty using this big data because it takes a long time to download the data, process it, and analyze it. So I wrote to myself, well, what kind of solutions could there be? Uh, data compression, modeling the data, okay? So that kind of was a statement of a problem, and it definitely applied to the genomes. And then, entirely by coincidence, that same day, in the evening, I was reading a blog, a very interesting article in a blog, uh, on a method for visualizing time series data. So a very, very interesting blog uh, that where they took uh, data from Twitter accounts, and they created a very neat transformation to visualize data from a Twitter account. And you can see, if you go to that page, uh, very distinct patterns from this is what it looks like when a human is typing uh, on Twitter, or this is when a bot is publishing stuff on Twitter. Okay, so very, very different patterns. And I saw that and I thought, wow, this is really interesting, a very, very interesting idea. And I wrote to myself, you know, consider time maps for genome data. And, and that's where it stopped. So two weeks later from these two things, here's a need, big data, how do we manage and analyze and download process all this big data? And the second idea of time maps for genome data. So I went back after that when I recognized this as potential sources, I went back to that blog. And in that blog, there is this beautiful drawing of a time series. So you can see a horizontal line with one point, one time point, another time point, another time point, uh, which in my mind as a genomicist, of course, I see there a chromosome with variants mm -hmm. along the chromosome. And then there is this representation of the distance between the consecutive time points, which are then used in the method to visualize the data. So in retrospect, I look at this figure again, I see clearly here's a chromosome, here's the the variants along the chromosome and the distances between consecutive variants. See what I mean? I mean, the, the blog is in totally not about that. But here's an example of uh, two weeks before that, the problem arises, completely unrelated idea with similar structure, just impinge into my, uh, into my brain. And two weeks later, the idea comes up. That's fascinating. I, I just... Yeah, I just loved seeing this thing. You know, where do ideas come from? It's just from getting exposed to interesting ideas and your brain will recombine them. Gustavo, it was a pleasure to, to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure as well. Mm -hmm.